Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you at home coming today. Good morning. Oh, okay. Y'all going to say good morning? I'll say it back. Good morning. Good morning. That oh, sounds great. Let's stand together and let's sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit, number 243. this time. Be seated. The words on the screen. When we all get to heaven, we'll do the first and the last verse. Mm -hmm. 
to the day when we all get to heaven. Amen? Amen. And I hope that you do look forward to that as well. We are so delighted to have you here this morning, and what a privilege it is to be able to gather together and to worship the Lord. I am always delighted and excited because we are invited into the presence of God as we worship Him this morning. Amen? Amen. I hope that you picked up a bulletin on your way in this morning. Just a few things I want to mention very briefly. Number one, I know that we have many, many guests with us this morning that you have come back because either you have relatives uh, who are buried in our cemetery uh, or you were raised in this church or you're here visiting family. Whatever the occasion of your visit this morning, we are certainly uh, delighted to have you here and honored uh, by your presence this morning. You'll notice located in the back of your pew a little welcome visitor card. We invite you to take that, fill it out, tear it off at the perforated line, and as as the offering plate comes your way this morning, that you would simply contribute that uh, to the offering. And we don't ask our guests to give. We simply ask that you deposit that little slip. And we don't want to pester you or bug you. We simply want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning. A couple things I want to mention. Number one, this coming Wednesday night is our business meeting. I want to remind you all that at our business meeting, we do eat. That's what makes it worth coming to. And so we'd love to have you bring something good to eat, and we'll have a good time uh, starting at 6 uh, o'clock. This meeting will follow at 7 on next this coming Wednesday night. And then also, May the 14th, all of our men, next Sunday morning uh, at 7.30 at Cedar Cove Store, we'll have our brotherhood breakfast. So you come and fellowship all of our men as we seek to be the men uh, that God is calling us to be. So come to that fellowship. also want to remind you that we will have no Sunday night service tonight, uh, given the fact it is decoration. Uh, but we are going to have a wonderful meal after this service. And so I promise that I'll preach half as long because there's food on the table. And uh, somebody said, I'll tell you how we can get Brother Spencer to preach short. We'll have a meal. And so, uh, but no, we are grateful to have you here this morning, grateful for the time of fellowship that we're going to have. And so I look forward to worshiping with you this morning. Uh, as we continue in this time of worship, I want to invite you, if you will, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to meet with us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we pause this morning with hearts full of gratitude uh, for who you are for what you've done, the blessings that you've bestowed and, Father, the grace so freely extended to all who believe. And so, Father, I pray that as we gather this morning in sp that we would worship you in spirit and in truth in one accord, that, Father, you would be glorified, Satan would be mortified, and your word might go forth as the ever-living, ever-present, ever-working, wonderful word of life. Father, I pray that you'd meet with us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would convict us, that he'd encourage us, he'd edify us. But Father, I pray that as we draw near to you this morning, as we stand in, amazed in your presence, Father, may you touch our hearts, speak to our hearts in a very special way as only you can. Father, bless our time of worship. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Because we recognize this morning, as in all other mornings, that you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Remind us of that this morning as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scene number 177. This is a short chorus here, but uh, we're going to add a little something to it at the end. So if you wouldn't mind, please stand up with us. There is something about that name, gorgeous song. Mm -hmm. 
going to invite the ushers to come forward this morning as we pray together for this morning's tithes and these offerings. Our Heavenly Father, as we stand in your presence this morning, we certainly want to be mindful uh, to praise you not only with our voices, not only with our hearts, but Father, we want to praise you by our giving, recognizing that every good and perfect gift indeed comes from above. And Father, may this offering that we give as a portion, returning to you what's rightfully yours, may it be used for the advancement of the Great Commission because of the Great Commandment. May it be used to carry forth your gospel through this church, through our community, around the world, as we seek to be fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless this offering. May it glorify and exalt your name. And it's in that precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 
sing our praise and worship song this morning, Live in Hope, as that you stand. Words will be on the screen here momentarily. It's great to see a great crowd today. It starts out with how great the chasm that lay between us. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one you set me Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, I live in hope. Let's do that chorus again. may be seated. I want you to take your Bibles this morning. If you have them, please turn with me to Paul's first letter to Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17 this morning. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 17. We do indeed gather because Jesus is our living Hope. Thank you, Randall, for that, and thank you so much, choir. Uh, how that just blessed my heart. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. That is my favorite song, and so grateful to have our choir sing that and bless my heart this morning, as I know God blessed your heart through them. I want you to look with me, First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. You know, it is our homecoming. Uh, we have gathered here as a homecoming celebrating 170 years. Now, I don't think any of us in this room were here 170 years ago when it was founded. Some of you look like you might have been. Uh, but we are, we are thankful for the wonderful 170 years that God has faithfully wrought us together uh, to serve Him uh, and to know Him and to advance His mission and His gospel. But it's also, as, it's also Decoration Day. Now, when I went to uh, serve at Gum Springs as their interim pastor, you know, I was raised up in the great big city of Hartsell, Alabama. Uh, and when I went out to the country, which Hartsell, I think, is a country, but you go out apparently further than the country, I had to have them explain to me what in the world is decoration. Uh, I didn't know what it was, but, it's, but I tell you, it's such a great time uh, where we can reflect on the saints who have gone before us. We can remember what God has done. And we look to the future with great anticipation as what God is going to do. Decoration Day is indeed a day that is a special day for us in where we memorize and we remember, and we commit to our hearts those who poured into our life, uh, those who loved us as we loved them, whether they be friends, whether they be family, whether they be fellow church members that we've seen to go home to be with the Lord as they took their final, they came a homecoming, but we celebrate today not for a homecoming, but for a home going. That one day we are going to a home indeed that God has prepared for us. Decoration Day is also a day where we have eternity in mind. We recognize that eternity awaits all people. 
Now, whatever happens in eternity is up to the decisions that you make and the opportunities that God has given us here on earth. But eternity indeed does await. And for those who draw life's final fleeting breath and exert the final ounce of ebbing strength from their bodies, we know that on the other side of our final goodbye is a hello somewhere beyond. We do know that eternity does await. And with eternity, we have the thought of death. Oh, that's the subject no one really wants to think about. Uh, Death is not something that in a past time I spend my entire life thinking about. I do think about heaven. I do think about glory. But I'm not exactly looking forward to the moment of death. But when it comes, I know that God who has saved me, God who has purchased me, God who has kept me is going to reveal to me his eternal glory. And the riches and the treasures we've laid up in heaven in Christ Jesus. A famous communist philosopher, he stood before a group of eager students. And while he was teaching, a student stood up and and he said, Professor, I don't mean to sound dumb or ignorant or to cause any trouble. But I really have a question I've got to ask you. He said, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? I believe all of us have answered that question in our own right. We've sought the Scriptures. Uh, We've sought our purpose. Uh, We've sought what does the world say that life is? What do scientists say that life is? What does God say that life is? What is life? Uh, We understand that in Christian wisdom, the question has already been asked and answered. I believe it was in James chapter 4 and verse 14. The Bible tells us, For you are a mist that, or a vapor that appears for a little while and then passes away, vanishes. It's gone. A mist. If you've ever sprayed something that's a mist, it's not there very long. It seems to just drift off into the atmosphere. It's something that doesn't really exist. We understand that life is but a vapor. We're here one day and gone the next. We do understand, though, that this communist philosopher was not a Christian, and his response, as he beat around the bush, his final conclusion was this. Professor Schaff replied with, after careful consideration, he said, as long as people die, suffer, lose their loved ones, just so long will questions about the meaning of life have full rights. In essence, as long as there's so much bad... I guess we'll never know. You see, death in the modern philosophy of many is like closing the final chapter of a book. You know, I read a lot. I've got in my study between here and the house about 4,000 volumes. I do like to read. And often I like to read about eight books at the same time. And when I finish a book, I close it and I put it on the shelf. And very rarely, unless I'm preparing a sermon, am I going to come back to that book. There's a lot of people that think life is that way, that it unfolds in chapters. And after the final chapter is penned, and after it is written, and after the conclusion of death is closed, the book is then placed on the shelf, never to be glanced at anymore. It's simply gone, and oftentimes it is indeed forgotten. There are many observations and speculations about what happens after death. Five minutes after death, what happens? Some people think it's lights off, and that's it. That just as we didn't know what happened before we were born, we die and don't know what happens after we die. It's just lights out. Some people believe that we're reincarnated. As Christians, we have the hope of eternity that we know because of our decision and our faith place in Christ that there is a home prepared for us and we are going to bask and stand in the presence of His eternal glory. There are some who believe that everyone's going to heaven and we know that can't be the case. And so what is death? What is life? What's the meaning of life? What happens? That's not the question I want to ask this morning. What is the meaning of life? The question I want to ask this morning to you is what is your life? And I want to ask a little further and ask you, does what you think about death dictate how you live your life? Does what you think about death dictate how you live? Live your life. For the man we're about to read in just a few moments as he writes to young Timothy, we find that what he thought about death indeed dictated how he lived his life. He had a very high view of death. He had a very strong consideration as to what was going to happen to him when he left this life and breathed his last and entered into the eternal presence of God. His entire life was defined 
through death, but also he had a consideration of life. He had lived life to the fullest. He considered it as dung compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. His Lord, And so we see that he writes to young Timothy. I want you to stand with me this morning as we read God's Word together in honor of his holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible, inexhaustive, and authoritative Word this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And God's Word says this. Paul writes, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. Underline that, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. And for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word this morning, as we sit in your presence, Father, we do ask that your word would leap off the pages into our hearts, that it would speak to us. Father, that your Holy Spirit would do a work in us this morning. As we think about decoration and home going and we think about eternity, Father, may we think about faithfulness. You counted Paul faithful. May the same be said of us. Father, I pray that you'd permit me to preach as a dying man to a dying world in order that people might be brought to you that... Sin would be mortified, Satan would be horrified, but you would be glorified. And Father, that we would know you in a special way. Speak to our hearts this morning. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, our eyes to the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will, you may be seated this morning. The Apostle Paul writes to young Timothy, his protege, his mentee, and his son in the gospel ministry about Paul's own journey of faith. Paul had just recently discussed all of the sins and all of the immorality, and now he writes to Timothy about his own journey of faith, and oh, what a journey it has been. It has been a journey for the Apostle Paul as he had seen a life that was considered of wealth and worldly wisdom to a life that was now of the grace of God, full of the gospel, going all about the earth. Paul was a man who was basking in the grace of Almighty God. And for Paul, his heart, we read in the Scripture just as we read just a moment ago, his heart was filled with gratitude. Three times we see that he uses the word thankfulness or grateful, thanksgiving. Paul was a thankful man. And the reason Paul was a thankful man is because as he reflected on his life previous to his life present, he could see the wonderfully wrought hand of God that wrought grace in the heart of the Apostle Paul. Paul was basking in the overflowing grace of Almighty God. And Paul said, I now live a new life. That is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He recognized that the life he lived in the flesh was no longer the life he was living, but he was living by faith in the Son of God who loved him and gave himself up for him. But Paul lived by a new secret. It was the new meaning of life. Paul had found the secret of living. Paul had found the purpose of life. And I'm sure there are some of us here today that in the question I asked at the start, what we think about death, but more specifically, what is the meaning of life? Paul has the answer. The meaning of life is not in success. The meaning of life is in faithfulness. And I want to preach a message simply entitled, He Considered Me Faithful. I pray that the same would be true of us today, that God would be able to look at us and say that He, I consider my servant faithful. Last Sunday, if you were here, we studied the book of Job. And oh, how faithful Job was. He did falter in some ways, but he was faithful to serve the God that he loved for nothing. We find that faithfulness is the true success. Faithful is the meaning of life. Faithfulness is how God measures success. 
Mark Hatfield was touring Calcutta, India with Mother Teresa, and they were visiting where Mother Teresa had done all of her work in a place called the House of the Dying. It was where sick children, they basically line up to receive some medical help, and there were hundreds upon hundreds of children standing there. And watching Mother Teresa minister to all of these children, Hatfield was so overwhelmed by the magnitude and the multitudes of people's illnesses and the amount of people that she had coming to them. And in awe, he basically asked her, rather puzzled, he said, How do you handle all of the stress? How does the burden just not come crashing down on you as you minister to all of these people? And Mother Teresa very calmly and very quickly replied, God did not call us to be successful. He called us to be faithful. If there's anything that the New Testament church of today ought to hear and the New Testament Christian ought to hear, that is the word. There's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with money. But true success in the eyes of God is not measured by how much money's in the bank, what car you drive, what house you live in, or how big your tombstone is in the cemetery. Success is measured by faithfulness to his call. The, the Apostle Paul was a trustworthy individual who was simply faithful, and that's why God counted him as faithful. And the word, that word there as he uses in verse 12, counted, simply carries the idea of pondering or considering carefully a course of action and taking into account the various issues at stake. That's what consideration is, that God had considered him after examining his life. He considered him faithful. And so on this marvelous day of homecoming as we've gathered here with family and friends and we're going to be eating a marvelous meal in a few moments, I want us to consider this morning four things that if we want God to look at our life and say, I consider them faithful. There's four things I want you to consider and I'll be brief. Number one, I want you to notice that a faithful life Living a faithful life. A faithful life is a life marked by grace. A faithful life is a life marked by grace. You know, a faithful life is impossible to lead, it is impossible to live, and it is impossible for you to learn unless you are basking in the manifested grace of God. It was Julia H. Johnson who wrote the words. She was the daughter of a Presbyterian minister. And she wrote those words we so boldly proclaim. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that pardons and cleanses within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. You know, we often boast about the grace that we have. We love to sing about God's grace. It is the grace of God that reaches the deepest center. But you and I must also understand that although the grace of God is wonderful and although many of us in this room are living a grace-centered, grace-filled, grace-lived life, we must understand what we were before we understand what we are. You see, Paul had understood through his entire life that his life was marked by grace. He'd experienced, as the hymn writer wrote, dark is the stain that it cannot hide. But he also knew of what the hymn writer said, that look, there is flowing a crimson tide. He had also experienced that sin and despair, like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. But oh, when Christ came on the Damascus road to redeem Saul of Tarsus, he became the apostle Paul. We recognize that yes, grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Paul's life was a life that was marked by grace, refuging himself in the mighty cross of Jesus Christ, his Lord. And his entire life, because of the grace that was marking his life, as he said, I bear on my body the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, he knew that his entire life permeated with thanksgiving, not only for his salvation, but for the privilege of having been made an apostle. Paul knew he deserved justice. All of us in this room deserve God's justice. What is justice? Justice is when God gives us what we deserve. We recognize that we deserve God's justice. But God's grace is, grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. And you and I, our presence here this morning, the opportunity we have to open his word, to pray together, to worship together, that is a privilege offered by God's grace that we don't deserve this privilege, but God has granted it to us.
Oh, that we might recognize that God is a God of grace. And it freely is bestowed upon all who believe. I love what A.W. Tozer said about grace. Every morning and every evening I'm going through some devotionals by A.W. Tozer. He was a prolific author. He was a profound preacher. But A.W. Tozer once said, Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him, motivates him, to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. Its use to us sinful men is to save us and make us sit together in heavenly places to demonstrate to the ages the exceeding riches of God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has been motivated, compelled to send His Son to give us what we don't deserve. And God has taken our life like a piece of clay on a pottery wheel. And He has taken it and He has taken that blob of clay that's absolutely meaningless and worthless and nothing and He's basically with His hands, He's curiously wrought, the Bible says in Psalm 37, He has molded us to be exactly what He wants us to be. And that's only done by the grace of God. Sir Edward Lanzier was a famous artist. He was contracted all over the world to paint these glorious paintings and also to do very specific portraits of famous people. And he was in the Victorian era, and while he was staying with one of his relatives who happened to be very wealthy in an old mansion in Scotland, one of the servants that was serving the family and serving Sir Lanzier, he spilled a pitcher of soda all over the wall, and it stained it. They couldn't get the stain out. It was red. They could do nothing with it. So while the family was out one day, he had stayed behind to get some rest, and he kept looking at that stain. And what he did is he got some charcoal, and he spent a few hours, and he turned that stain into a majestic, picturesque landscape of a stream and a few houses and a church and town. And he took that beautiful, picturesque landscape and he took that stain and he took the stain and he made something out of his skill, something beautiful as, as what had been an unsightly mess. God does the same thing with us. God did the same thing with the Apostle Paul. His entire life was marked by grace. Paul had been something else. He had been an old creature, but God took him and put him on his spinning wheel and fashioned him to be exactly what God wanted him to be because God saw the potential to use the Apostle Paul. And I'm grateful to God that God offers the invitation this morning that he sees the potential to use us to be just exactly what he wants us to be by his grace. A faithful life. It's a life marked by grace. There's a second thing. Not only is it a life marked by grace, but secondly, a faithful life is a life manifested by fruit. Manifested by fruit. Grace, faith, and love became Paul's, Paul's favorite words. In fact, if you look at all of Paul's epistles, you look at all of his writings, if you count Hebrews, there's 14 of them. If you look at all of his writings, you'll never read one of them without look, seeing three words, faith, love, and grace. Never will you find the Apostle Paul without mentioning faith, love, and grace. He had talked about his former life. You see, his blasphemies had been removed by God's grace. His desire to persecute Christians had been replaced by faith. And his injurious behavior had been revolutionized by God's love. Grace was the theme song of Paul's life. It defined every ounce of strength Paul used on behalf of the gospel. He led a faithful life because of the grace of God. But a faithful life is evidenced by the fruit which it bears. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, that's the key, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Boy, I tell you, we try to do a lot of things in our own strength, don't we? Every week, not a week goes by that I don't try that. And I try to try to solve my own problems, and I hear I get phone calls, and well, we got to go put out this fire, and we've got to run here, and we've got to run there, and very quickly, and usually abruptly, the Lord reminds me that it is not in my strength that I can do anything; it is in the strength of Christ, recognizing that oftentimes He prunes us, 
Again, he fashions us, he shapes us, he molds us, he wrought us to be exactly what he wants us to be. But there has to be fruit. And that fruit comes from, what does he say in John 15, 5, remaining in him. I was doing some financial study this week. I was looking at my retirement counts, and I was reading something about Dave Ramsey. In a 1994 interview, Dave Ramsey uh, was asked why, this is 1994 now, we're in 2023. 1994, they asked Dave Ramsey, they said, can you tell us why Americans have so much credit card debt, usually have about $250,000 in some kind of loans or debts, and they still keep going out and buying more stuff. And he said, I'll tell you what it is. They lack contentment. They lack contentment. If you want to know what a lot of problems are in life, it's the fact that we lack contentment. We lack the contentment of being in Christ. We fail to recognize that our relationship with God is indeed enough. Paul said, I have learned to live with nothing. I've learned to live in abundance. But I am content in whatever the circumstance. Why? Because the Apostle Paul knew that the fruit of his life, again, was not in success, but it was simply drawing near and being faithful to seek God, to know God, to serve God in everything that he did. I want to ask you this morning. You know, we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you want to know whether you're a born-again child of God, a lot of people ask me that. They say, how can I know I'm saved? Well, the Bible says in 1 John, it says, I've written these things that you may know that you're saved. And, but I say, well, let me ask you this. What fruit do you have in your life? If you have no fruit, there's probably no root of Christ. But where there is fruit, there is a strong root, a strong contentment, a strong foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because a faithful life, if you want to lead a faithful life, it's a life of fruit. It's a life of service. It's a life of dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. A faithful life, it's a life marked by grace. A faithful life is a life manifested by fruit. There's a third thing. If you want to lead a faithful life, number three, I want you to notice that a faithful life is a life motivated to serve. It is a life motivated to serve. I want you to look back at verse 12 in your Bible there. Verse 12, the last part. Verse 12 chapter of chapter 1. And he says, Putting me into service. Putting me into service. That's a sermon in itself. Putting me into service. Now, he didn't say I called myself. He didn't say I put myself into service. He didn't say Mama threw me down at that altar and said, If you don't get saved, I'm going to wear you out. He said, Lord, put me into service. He called me. He saved me. He's using me. He has commissioned me. He has put me into service. Paul speaks right there in verse 12 of an overflowing heart of gratitude because Christ had shown his confidence in Paul and in his worth by putting him into the ministry. I love what Augustine once said. Augustine said in his writings, he said, God does not choose a person who is worthy, but by the act of choosing him, God makes him worthy. Worthy. I'm grateful to God that although we are totally worthless, God has deemed us worthy because of the precious blood that was shed for us, because of the powerful call that he has commissioned us, and the glorious gospel that he is asking us to go and to share. I'm grateful that God, although we are deemed worthless, that our righteousness are nothing but filthy rags, God has taken those rags, he's washed them as white as snow, because he has made us worthy. Worthy. I'm glad to be counted as worthy this morning because of his calling. Paul said it was he who commissioned me into service. Paul was overjoyed at the confidence that God had in the Apostle Paul. Because I want to remind you of something, as I said a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's worth saying again. I think oftentimes we put too much emphasis on our faith in God, we fail to recognize God's faith in his children. God indeed has faith in his children. He had faith in Job, that Job was going to serve him faithfully regardless of whatever kind of attacks or deployments the devil attempted to inflict upon Job. God has faith in his children to do 
what God has called them to do. And the Apostle Paul, because he was considered faithful, he was motivated to serve. And I believe the reason that God used the Apostle Paul so mightily in his service is that Paul recognized how worthless he was in comparison to the glory of Christ. Look at verse 15. Look at what he says. He said, it is a trustworthy statement. It is absolutely true without error, without blemish. He says, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he says, among whom I am the foremost of all. Now we're talking about the Apostle Paul here. God used him to write books and books of Scripture. He says, I am the worst of all. Now, why would Paul say something like that? I mean, my gracious. Paul's a pretty righteous man. He's a pretty holy man. Why would Paul say that? Well, it's because of a verse close to it. Notice what he says in verse 13. He said, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly, an unbelief. And no, blasphemer, persecutor, and violent aggressor. I can see the Apostle Paul as he's finishing to, he's about to conclude his second missionary journey, going to the first Baptist church at Corinth and, and because they had heard about him, they had received his resume from one of the local churches in the area. And so they call old Paul. They say, we hear you're coming off the mission field. You're coming in from your missionary journey. We want to talk with you about coming and being our pastor. And so Paul shows up and man, they had heard about his bold preaching and they had heard all about Paul and all he's done, all the people that have come to Christ and all the churches that have been planted. And they ask him, they say, well, Paul, we've heard all these wonderful things about what God has done in your life, but may we ask you, can you share with us some prior experience that you have? I hate that word experience. Prior experience that you have apart from the church. And he said, well, I, I'll tell you a few things. He said, well, I was a blasphemer, and I was a persecutor, and I was a violent man. I can imagine the chairman of the pastor search committee <laughs> shuffling his papers in disbelief, looking at him and saying, uh, Joe, do you have something to add? Well, we'll get back with you. We'll get back with you. I can imagine as Paul leaves the room and he gets on his mule or however he got to the first Baptist church at Corinth. And they said, I don't think we're going to call him. He got too much baggage that comes with him. The Apostle Paul would have been disqualified by most in the ministry today because of his past. I don't think we quite understand the gravity of Paul's sins. Blasphemer, persecutor, a violent man. It would be about the equivalent to Paul single-handedly causing the Holocaust. In fact, he writes in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26 these words. Listen to Paul. See if you'd call him as your next pastor. In Acts chapter 22 and 26, he said, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things, contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And then when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange foreign cities. How about calling Paul as your next pastor of Mount Zion? Most people say he's disqualified. We can't have that man. Man, he's going to run all our people off. Look at the reputation Paul has. But oh, how God used Paul so mildly because Paul said, I am the chief among sinners. Do you know why God used Jonah so mildly? Because Jonah, although he ran from God, God saw that although he was ignited with the wrong passion, God could take Jonah, God could ignite him with a new passion, with a new purpose, and he could use Jonah in a powerful way. And Jonah... Theologians believe that the revival in Nineveh was the greatest revival in history. Jonah didn't want to go. God set him straight. If God has the power to redeem a sinner like that, as Paul was so thankful for being redeemed by the grace of God, then he has the power to redeem us this morning. And that is why finally I want you to notice It's not your ability, that it's your availability because a faithful life, although it may be motivated to serve, finally, a faithful life is a life mercifully secured. Mercifully secured. I want you to look at verse 16 as we prepare to conclude. Chapter 1, verse 16. Yet for this reason, I found mercy. Boy, aren't you grateful that we found mercy this morning? 
I found mercy. So that in me as the foremost, he's talking about chief of all sinners again, he says, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. I am thankful. Paul says, I'm thankful that God was patient with me. That as I was going around and persecuting and murdering and slandering all of his people, I'm glad God was patient with me, that he saved me, and now he's using me so undeservingly but so mercifully. He knew that God was using him simply because of the great mercy of God. And grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. Justice is when God gives us what we deserve. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve. That was mercy. That was the Apostle Paul's life. He knew that his life was a life of faithfulness because it was a life covered in mercy. It was washed in grace. It was compelled by love. And the reason that Paul shared such a horrible past was to glorify God for his salvation in the present. Paul knew more than anyone that where there's no repentance, there's no faith, Where there's no faith, there's no salvation. And Jesus is not in the business of saving good people. But in verse 15, he says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save the lost. I'm grateful that we live a merciful life. Not that we are perfect in mercy, but that God is merciful, in which he reached down his hand to save Lost sinners like us. And I'm grateful to God that one day, one day, we will truly recognize that our salvation is very little, if anything, to do with us. But it's all God. That instead of condemning us, and instead of casting us out, instead of throwing all of us into the fiery hell like we deserve, That God, by His grace, offers an invitation to us. And that God, He takes our life, and by His mercy, He saves us, He calls us, He uses us, that we would recognize that it is not out of our own strength where we keep our salvation, but it's by the strength of God that He keeps us. And the Bible says that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Salvation is very little to do with us. It's very much to do with God. But God offers a free invitation this morning by His grace to come to Him. Thousands came to faith in Christ through Moody's meetings as he approached the end of his life. And he viewed heaven, D.L. Moody said, as something to anticipate. I share that same hope this morning. D.L. Moody said, he said, someday you'll read in the papers that the evangelist D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? Because at the moment I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, and out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born in the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1856. And that which is born of the flesh may die, but that which is born of the Spirit will live forever. Dietrich Bonhoeffer shared the same thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian uh, during the Nazi invasion of Germany and Poland and all of that. He actually pastored a church in London, but he returned to Germany in order that, as a Lutheran, he might bring people to Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, they had caught that he was, he was conspiring with several people, a group of Christians, to try and see how they could get rid of Adolf Hitler. And so what they did is they put Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a concentration camp. They tortured him. Yet while he was in there, he wrote letters. In fact, you can read all of the letters he wrote in prison while they were torturing him and beating him and knew that his death was imminent. And the last words recorded by Dietrich Bonhoeffer as the people were about to execute him as they took him and they were going to mercilessly kill him. He said these last words. He was 39 years old and he said, This is the end, but for me, it's the beginning of life. What great news it is that although we celebrate this morning the homecoming, 
our church and the decoration of the saints that have gone before us, I praise God that although we adorn the grave with flowers and although we recognize that they've gone before us, friend, they, they aren't really concerned about the flowers you put on the grave because they're experiencing something much more. And I long for the day when my clock stops ticking. Charles Spurgeon said, your clock is always ticking. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. He said, what are you going to do with the time you have left? And I pray that my life would be a faithful life. That it would be a life characterized by service, by grace, by mercy, by salvation. And I pray that my life would be examined by the Lord as I stand before him on the day I take my last breath and enter eternity. I pray he'll look at my life and say, I consider you faithful. May that be our prayer this morning. May that may be our heart's desire that God would consider us faithful. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, our prayer this morning is that we would be faithful Father, we'd be faithful to your call, to your church, to your commission, to your commandments. But Father, may you simply rest your hand upon us that you would use us, recognizing that it's no longer I who live or we who live, but it's you who lives in and through us. God, may you take our hands off the wheel and may you have total control as we totally surrender this morning to your will your wisdom, your power. Father, I pray this morning that as we gather here, I'm sure there are maybe one, two, three, there may be several people here this morning who have never made that decision to trust in you as their Savior and their Lord. Father, I pray that they would make that decision this morning, that by your Holy Spirit you would convict their hearts, that you would cleanse them, as they call upon you in repentance and faith, recognizing their weakness, but also recognizing your strength. Father, may we be people marked by grace. And may in this time of invitation, we make that a reality. And so, Father, I pray for anyone right now needing to make a decision to come to you, whether it be to, for salvation or baptism or church membership or they have a need impressed upon their heart. God, would you give them the strength to walk down this aisle, come to this altar, give themselves totally to you. Father, move in this time of invitation. And we're going to give, be very careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn. The altar's open. We invite you to come. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'd be honored to do that if you'll just come to me as we stand and sing our closing hymn. Brother Randall. Number 329, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <laughs>
I'm grateful for the good news of grace, that it is greater than our sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. So thankful that you are here this morning. We've got a wonderful meal prepared. I cooked every bit of that in there, so you come. No, I didn't. Uh, I brought an appetite. That's my contribution. So you enter those doors right there, or you can go around. And so we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship in the fellowship hall. Look forward to meeting some of you, fellowshipping with our members. So uh, you feel free to stay and eat. I promise you, at Mount Zion, we have no shortage of food. Please eat all that you can. And so I hope that you'll stay for that. I'm, I'm going to ask my dear friend, A.G. Step. Where are you, A.G.? All right, he's in the back. All right, well, brother, how about you dismiss us in prayer this morning?